well, I know you've never heard of him before, but he is the love of my life, which is Matt Crandall, and I did marry him in spite of the collection, but he, on the Alice in Wonderland DVD that uh, Disney has done both with the Unbirthday edition and the Blu-ray collection, he is referred to as, a, as an Alice authority. And he is now the creator of the Jeppy Lost in Wonderland collection, my husband Matt Crandall. Good afternoon. Hi. I'm here to talk about everybody's <laughs> favorite subject, Disney's Alice. <laughs> um, the title of my talk is Alice in Disneyland, but it's not about Disneyland. Alice in Disneyland actually came from this article in an old film review book from England, where they referred to the world of Disney films generically as Disneyland. And also the banner at the top of the, all of the slides is actually ribbon that also came from England. Um, that's calls it Alice in Disneyland. And I don't know if it's a phrase that originated in England or if I've just only found English things to say Alice in Disneyland, but it sounded like a catchy uh, title and I'm sure Walt stole it when he you know, designed his theme park f four years later. So the history of Disney and Alice goes all the way back to the founding of the Walt Disney Company. In 1923, um, Walt was still in Kansas City working for company called Newman's Laughograms, and they made short, very short animated commercials for local businesses that would, you know, screen on the local movie theaters. And that company was going under. And so what he did was he hired um, this little girl named Virginia Davis, and he created a little short called Alice's Wonderland, and he was using it as his, his promo reel for himself to start up a new animation company. And so he would send this reel out to all of various movie studios saying, hey, I can make these really cool uh, short subjects featuring this live little girl in this animated wonderland. And in uh, the fall of 1923, he moved to Los Angeles with his brother Roy, signed a, a deal with uh, Mintz and Winkler, uh, which later became Universal, and the Alice comedies were born. Um, there were 57 Alice comedies produced over the period of four years. Uh, sadly, 17 of those films are now lost, but Alice was what founded the Walt Disney Company in 1923, not Mickey Mouse. So, even though Alice uh, was the founding of the company and, and Walt liked you know, what he did, he always wanted to continue on and do more with Alice because he loved the story so much. Another person who was really into Alice was Mary Pickford. And in 1932, she decided that she wanted to kickstart her career again because it essentially had ended. And she decided that she was the perfect person to play Alice. And she herself shot this test Technicolor footage on her own dime to try and convince Walt Disney to put her in a combo live action animated Alice in Wonderland movie. And this still um, was also from that same photo shoot where she's, you know, very gratuitously holding Mickey Mouse saying, look, we're the perfect match. Um, sadly, um, or maybe not so, I don't know if it would have done very well. Um, you, um, Paramount's Alice pretty much put the kibosh on it because they had acquired all the appropriate copyrights both here and in England for 33, and so that film never did happen. Um, and there it is. So, he still got the bug. Um, in 1936, he created the Mickey Mouse short subject called Through the Mirror, which is actually very fun. Um, he goes through the looking glass, dances around with cards, and has all sorts of hijinks. So it's an eight-minute short subject. Alice is still on his mind. In 1939, he's still looking to try and figure out how to do a full-length feature. He had a successful uh, venture into that with Snow White. They were already working on Pinocchio and Fantasia. So he's wanting to go back to Alice. So he hires an artist another Englishman named David Hall, and he does a series of story paintings and drawings which are truly amazing. He did over 400 of them, um, a combination of black and white and watercolor. And that movie would have been something to see because they're very outside of what you would normally think of as now, anyway, a traditional Disney movie. They to sort of fit in with the sort of scariness of Snow White and Pinocchio, but they're, some of them are downright creepy. I mean, 
there's one that I've seen of, of Alice standing next to the executioner, and he's big and huge, and he's got this axe, and she's looking very terrified. Um, and I think that would have been a very cool movie. But sadly, again, World War II came, and this movie never happened either. But Disney did release this wonderful book in 1984. That's the full story, and it's all illustrated with David Hall illustrations, and they're amazing. And if you can get yourself a copy of this book, you should. So, the next up, 1944, Ginger Rogers, also looking to kickstart her career again, uh, decides that she would be the perfect live action Alice in an animated film. And she records this record set to, again, try and get interest going in an Alice picture. And actually, Disney did the art for the cover. I don't know if you can see it down there at the bottom by her knee. It actually says Walt Disney. He provided the art for the cover. But this movie didn't happen either. So they're still trying to figure out how to do Alice. In 1945, they get Aldous Huxley to write a treatment for Alice. And Haley can probably tell you more about this than I can. I've not actually read it. I can't find a copy of it. But apparently, it's, it's, it just wouldn't work. <laughs> it was delightfully strange, and not in the sort of way, I don't mean strange in how Alice is generally strange. It's just a strange <laughs> story treatment that's actually a lot more along the lines of um, the Lou Boon In film, of like the idea of combining you know, Alice Little with Alice in Wonderland, and having Dodson as a character. It's a sort of mixing the text. So it's interesting that Disney almost made the Boudin film conceptually, and yet it took a left turn. Yeah. But it's, it's a strange... So once again, this movie never happened. So flash forward again a couple of years. We're now in 19... 48 and 49. He's still trying to get this movie made. He's starting to get an idea of how he wants to do it. He's got artists working on it. They're ready to roll. He's looking for a voice. Picks Margaret O'Brien. She has just been released from her MGM contract. And well, you know, she was kind of at the end of her childhood career. I mean, it was right near the end. But unfortunately, um, contract negotiations broke down with her mother. Um, and so they didn't pick her. But at MGM, at the same time, there was another child actress who was also released from her contract. And that was Catherine Beaumont. So Walt hired Catherine Beaumont to be the voice of Alice. Uh, this is a press photo dated June 13th of 1949. And production began immediately. She started recording voices for Alice. The very first scene that they did was the caterpillar sequence. Um, if you watch the film, you can sort of tell because she looks a lot younger in that sequence. Her face is a lot chubbier, and her voice is actually sounds younger because it, they recorded it so early on, there was a big hiatus between that and when they recorded the rest of it. They wanted something out there to let people know that, yes, we're making this film, finally. So production is beginning in earnest, and the look of the film is being entirely dictated by the artist Mary Blair. Um, she is a truly amazing artist. Her, her you know... Her color, her palette, and her design sense is really what made the Alice film what it is and what convinced Walt that they could actually do it and make it fun. So in addition to the voice, Catherine Bowman also did all the live action reference. So back in those days, and they even do still a little bit before they switched to purely 3D, they would actually film either the, the voice actors or other actors acting out the entire film. And they would then have the animators run the film, do a very light rotoscope where they would trace over blow-ups of the film under the cells, and then animate the, the final design look and feel of the character on top of that. But these are some of the terrifying <laughs> things that they put Catherine through to get the sequences in the film. I'm particularly fond of the flamingo over there with the hedgehog, where she's on the big seesaw. <laughs> so this is 1950, uh, and, and early 51 when they're doing this. Um, to announce to the world that they're getting ready to do Alice on Christmas Day, 1950. Walt Disney creates the very first television show for the Disney Company and is the very first movie producer to ever utilize television in this way. And all the other movie studios were really mad at him for it. But One Hour in Wonderland was released on Christmas Day, sponsored by Coca-Cola. 
Um, and it's great. If you haven't seen this, you should watch it just to see the, the very cleverly inserted Coca-Cola ad right in the middle where they interrupt the party and they bring out the tray of Coke bottles and everybody's having a Coke and a smile. And it's just wonderful. And weirdly with Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, um, I don't know why they were continuing that contract with them, but it's, it's, it makes for an unusual viewing, that's for sure. So, to continue with the promotion of the upcoming film into 1951, they have uh, an episode of the Fred Waring television show. Fred Waring was kind of like Lawrence Welk. Um, and in March of 1951, uh, Catherine Beaumont and Sterling Holloway both traveled to New York to film this live episode of the Fred Waring show. And where this, it was the entire second half hour of the show, they uh, acted out the sequence of, of Alice meeting the Cheshire Cat in the Told You Would. Um, and also a weird tea party sequence with the entire cast of the Pennsylvanians as the tea party guests. And what's really neat um, is if you see the backdrop like of where the Cheshire Cat is and the leaves behind Catherine, all of the sets were painted on location by Mary Blair. She came with them and did all of the set painting. And I would love to know what happened to those. <laughs> and of course, the Fred Waring Show, sponsored by General Electric. And they don't let you forget it. Um, so I threw up a couple of ads, and I just put this up here just for fun, because I know that in the UK, in uh, General Electric is Mazda, and I didn't know that there was a Mazda uh, promotion as well until I found that ad from Australia, so I just thought that was kind of cool. So we're still promoting the film. It hasn't even come out yet. In June, which is about a month before the movie is released, um, there's a television show called The Ford Festival, or sometimes called The James Melton Show. And while Walt did not actually appear on the show. He filmed uh, a sequence ahead of time and they screened it during the show. And what it is, it's sort of him following around the studio, going into all the various departments and they're showing how the film is being made. So they have people actually painting Alice cells in this movie and he's at the animation camera, which is something he would never do, putting cells of Tweedledee and Tweedledum across the background and taking pictures. and. They talk to Catherine Bowman as she's getting ready to go act out a scene with Ed Wynn. And it's amazing. And um, what's particularly amazing is there's one sequence in here where he's holding a bunch of cells in his hand getting, and showing the audience what cells look like. And one of them is one that is in our collection that's on display at Jeffy. <laughs> so that's pretty fun. All right, so we're finally there. July 26, 1951. Alice, or uh, Catherine, travels to London with Walt for the world premiere at the Leicester Square Theater. Premiered two days uh, earlier than it did in the US in London. Um, big fanfare, hoopla, all sorts of good stuff going on. Um, and then the movie is released and it does abysmally. <laughs> so, in 1954, Walt is now focusing on Disneyland. And in October, of 1954, he launches the Disneyland television program, which is basically a very large marketing campaign to get people excited about this new thing called a theme park called Disneyland. And on the second episode of this television show, they run all of the Alice film. It's the very first time a Disney movie has ever been shown on television. It's the very first time um, he's done anything like that on the Disneyland TV show, obviously. And weirdly, they produced merchandise for that Alice showing on the television show. At the exhibition, you'll see a pink plastic tea set and a metal tray. And it was created and released in 1954 as a promotion to have a contest to win a trip to Disneyland. So, the following year, Disneyland opens. And there is a very loosely themed <laughs> attraction for Alice in Wonderland called the Mad Tea Party, which is basically a spinning teacups ride. It was kind of a off-the-shelf carnival ride, which they repurposed and designed. They added, basically they added handles to the, to the ride cars to make them teacups. But, um, so they did lots of cool art for it and designed it. You see a construction photo down there. And these are the original tickets from that year. It was a B ticket. So, moving on. Now we go forward three years to 1958 and the Alice in Wonderland dark ride opens. This makes Alice the only attraction at that time to have two rides in the park. Um, and so they made a big deal about it, which is, 
I've never really understood because the movie was, did so poorly and Walt was so down on it at the time, but they made this huge fuss over the opening of this new Alice Dark Ride. Um, they did all kinds of newspaper ads, they did full-on press releases, they printed special tickets, um, new postcards, and this giant attraction poster, which is one of the coolest things there is. For the grand opening of it, they brought back Mouseketeer Karen Pendleton to play Alice. For the opening ceremony, you can see that Walt is handing her the key next to the weirdest white rabbit I've ever seen <laughs> and the scariest Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Uh, I've, I understand that the Mickey and Minnie costumes came from the ice capades. Um, so, but the weird round eyes with the pupils are very frightening. <laughs> they really are. All right, so, nothing's going on with Alice now for, for a long, long, long time. Um, until they start releasing their films on 16 millimeter for rental. And Alice is one of the very first ones that's available in that catalog, one of the first animated ones. And by this time, we're into the 60s, we're into counterculture, college students are like, hey, let's go watch Alice, you know? <laughs> and so it becomes huge on the college campus circuit. And they produce, you know, posters like this to stick around all of, you know, the dorms or wherever to get people to come see. And it's very, you know, it's, he's smoking the pipe, you know? It's, it's what they did back then. But because of that, and because of the massive success of the 16 millimeter rentals, Disney decides to re-release it, finally. And in 1974, they re-released the film for the first time since 1951 in this country. Now, they had released it previously overseas uh, in Europe in 1970, 1969 and 1970, but 74 was the very first reissue in the United States using that poster art. Um, <laughs> and they, weirdly, they reused that poster art in 1981. Um, which is bizarre because by that time the psychedelic era and counterculture was over and they just were bored and lazy and I don't think they cared, um, which is pretty much how the Disney company treated Alice until home video. Alice was in the first four films, they released four films on home video the first year they did it, 1981, and Alice was one of them. And they released it simultaneously on VHS, Betamax, and RCA CED. I don't know if any of you remember CED. It's this physical, it's like a record. Inside, it looks like a big floppy disk. It's, it's about that big and it's plastic case and you stick it in the player and it opens up like a floppy disk. And it's actually a rec like a record and there's a stylus that plays it like a record. So they wear out. And then obviously when Laserdisc came along later and obviously Blu-ray, um, I highly encourage you all to get this Blu-ray because I'm on it. Okay. And if those of you are, who are interested to find out why I'm called an Alice Authority, it's because when I was filming that sequence they said, what are your title? And I went, uh, I don't know, and I called Hans and said, what's my title? And he goes, well, you're an authority on Alice. Why don't you be an Alice authority? And I was like, okay, I'm the Alice authority. <laughs> so, home video. And the next thing is Tim Burton. In 2000, yes, I know. <laughs> it still counts. <laughs> In 2010, Disney decides to, you know, mine their vault of properties with their new theme of doing live action based upon their animated films, this was the first one, and um, they made Alice, what they called Alice. I don't think any of us agree that it is truly Alice, but there it is. It is massively successful. It's the highest grossing Disney film ever in history. It made a billion dollars, a billion dollars worldwide, guaranteeing a sequel, which is coming out next month. And as a result of that, they created at Disney's California Adventure, The Mad Tea Party. This is like a Disney rave. I swear, it's about the only way you can describe it. It's, it's like a dance club. Um, it's got their own DJ, DJ Rabbit there on the lower left. It's got, you know, Alice in Micro Mini with thigh high stockings and the band that's all based on characters. You know, the Mad Hatter and the March Hare play guitar and the Caterpillar plays the drums. I mean, it's, it's really strange and you can get alcohol and just get you know, completely blitzed and have a great time and dance and it's really popular. And it ran from, with one break, it ran from 2013 until just this past February, right? Close well, for the last time? It, it only plays during kind of the yeah. summer months, but it, it's starting up again Yeah. So it's massively successful. I mean, they, they had a hiatus when Frozen came out because they had to have the Frozen experience. But 
this took over from the Tron experience, and this has been way more successful. So despite their you know, blase attitudes towards the Alice property over the years, it still continues to do very well for them. And of course, leading up to the TV show, Once Upon a Time, in Wonderland, capitalizing on these very, very popular Once Upon a Time TV series, they started creating new spin-off series about various other properties focused specifically on them, and Alice was the first one. Um, it wasn't successful. Um, it lasted one season, but the character that plays um, this character right here, um, he did migrate into the main series. Um, and so it, his character continues, but the series itself is gone. And that brings us to next month, sequel to the Tim Burton Alice, which is now the Tim Burton Looking Glass. Um, I don't know what this is going to be like. I haven't seen it. I've seen some previews. It looks pretty similar. But I think the good thing is, in my opinion, that Tim Burton is not actually directing it. He is just producing it. But all of this popularity and success of the past few years with Alice has finally sort of sunk in with the Disney collective consciousness. And just this past Tuesday, they released this book, which is kind of like an expanded version of this talk. <laughs> it is Alice's illustrated journey through time at the Walt Disney Company. Um, written by Mark Salisbury, who writes a lot of art books for Disney. He did the art of the Burton Wonderland, and he did a bunch of art books for multiple studios. So it's very pretty. I just received my copy on Tuesday. Um, they use a lot of great art. They have a ton of Mary Blair and David Hall art in it. Um, and they talk about most of the things that I talk about. Um, they didn't go into the sort of minutia of leading up to it that I do, but um, it's pretty. Um, I haven't read it yet, but it, it's very attractive. <coughs> And all this leads up to, finally, the Lost in Wonderland exhibit, featuring the Crandall Collection at Jeppe's Entertainment Museum, which I hope everybody will see tomorrow. Oh. Thank you. Okay.